beautiful song, God of Calvary. We're in Discover Route 66, and so we're in 1 Corinthians. If you know 2 Timothy 3, 3, 16, all scriptures inspired by God is profitable for doctrine. Big book on doctrine we just came through was Romans that we looked at. Then it says, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Reproof has to do with behavior, okay? Corinthians is going to deal with reproof, going to deal with behavior. Correction has to do with beliefs, and you will see that when you read the book of Galatians, okay? And so Paul is going to, in this, this book, we're going to look at the church in Corinth. It is filled with much sin, much problems. Corinth had 200,000 freed citizens and about a half a million slaves. Now, you could still be a doctor and be a slave. I mean, it wasn't about your profession. I mean, there were many slaves at this time, and this ministry faced many challenges. And so let's dive off into this book. Uh, I think it's pretty evident uh, who wrote the book, and it is Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote this book. Now, in A.D. 50, Paul reached Corinth on his second missionary journey. You can read about this in Acts 18, 1 through 11, where he uh, lived with Aquila and Priscilla, and they were tent makers. And as his, uh, Paul's custom was, he first preached in the synagogue, then he was forced out, then he opened up shop next door in the house of justice, and they continued the ministry. He stayed there for about 18 months. He wrote this book while he was... Um, near the end of his three-year stay in Ephesus. And so he made three visits to Corinth. Uh, some of you, how many, how many letters did he write to Corinth? Four. You're right. It's first and second Corinthians. We have. But if you read 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13, he writes about a letter that now is lost. Apparently he wrote a letter previously than 1 Corinthians that we have. And see, so he had received a bad report. You're going to read from Chloe's household. And so then he writes 1 Corinthians. Then he sends Timothy and Erastus to Corinth. And uh, he hears of serious problems there. And he makes another hasty trip to Corinth, which he calls his painful visit. And he writes a severe letter. He talks about in 2 Corinthians when we get to that part, which is now lost to us. Then he searches for Titus and Troas and Macedonia, and he finds him, sends him to Corinth, I believe, and reports. And then he writes 2 Corinthians, and then he makes a third visit. So he writes four letters. You say, hey, why aren't those two letters in the Bible? Pretty simple. God didn't want them in there. Pretty much. If God wanted us to have them, they would be there. Now, you need to understand this church is one of discord. They've got some problems. As early as 95 A.D., Clement of Rome referred to this letter written by Paul. So everybody believes this letter was written by Paul. He opens it up pretty simple. Paul called an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. Okay, So Paul had most of those. It was written in 55 you see there. city of Corinth was about 45 miles southeast of Athens. Uh, it was a very important uh, city. It was strategic because of its location. It was located on this four mile stretch and it became a bridge for goods being transported from one end of the Mediterranean Sea to the other. You need to understand, um, Paul planted church is in big cities. Go study it. Say, did he care? Didn't care about those in the small? No. Where were the masses of people living? Big cities. Where did they need the gospel to get? the big cities, so then it could spread out to the other cities. You need to understand, that's basically what our North American Mission Board is, has done. They've picked the 32 largest lost cities in our country, and they're focusing on reaching them with planting many churches there. 
in one of those cities is Atlanta. And so Corinth was started as a Greek city. Um, then it was uh, it lay in ruins for a hundred years because it was destroyed. And in 44 BC, Julius Caesar came back and he rebuilt this city. And it became a very popular city. It was a city of commerce. You had sailors coming in there, and they would be transported in there for a while. And uh, you just need to understand, Corinth is a uh, uh, it's uh, Las Vegas on steroids. There's all kinds of temples in Corinth. It was a city of immorality. They had all sorts of gods. They worshipped Hercules. Uh, they had the, they worshipped the God of healing with his daughter Hygienia. There was the temple of uh, Poseidon. There was the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And, and many what went on in those temples was sexual immorality. Now, Corinth was also known for the Isthmus Games second only to the Olympic Games. It had a 20,000-seat out, outdoor theater. It was a big metropolitan city of 700,000 people. This is a big, big city uh, filled with all kinds of people, big economic center, great commerce, great idolatry. The word to Corinthianize, okay, they coined a word that, to Corinthianize because the city was the meaning to get involved in the worst of sexual immorality. Okay, so you need to understand, this is a wicked city. This is a tough place to um, hold up shop and plant a church. Okay, very difficult. Can it happen? Yes, sure can. Got a good friend and planted in Las Vegas. Now they have two campuses running 2,000 people Amen. and seen many Muslims saved in the last year. Where grace abounds, I mean where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. I mean, Corinth was the New York City, the Los Angeles, and Atlanta, and Vegas all wrapped in, up to one with New Orleans and Mardi Gras. And if you've never been to New Orleans and Mardi Gras, uh, you don't need to go. Because I lived within an hour of the French Quarter. You don't need to go. So that's the city. That's the background. That's what these people were getting saved out of. Okay, you got the picture? Okay, I mean, they're, they're, they're immersed in this. Not a whole lot different than what we live in today. Okay? Not a whole lot. Okay? So why was this book written? To show them to how to build a united, loving community of believers. Okay? And we'll, we'll see why they need to know how to build a, a united, loving community of believers. We're going to see that in this letter and the reason for that. Now, the purpose of writing this book is to reprove them for their flagrant sins. And I mean, Paul gets pretty up in their grill and is pretty frank with them on what's going on. And he has a straight-up discussion with them, and he don't hold anything back, and he don't sugarcoat it, and there is no little religious correctness here. But then he also writes to answer the questions about the Christian life and doctrine that we're going to see. And so, I mean, he's dealing two parts. You're going to see that in the outline when we get there in just a second. You'll see what's going on here. One part, he's dealing with the flagrant sins. Another part, he's saying, all right, this is, how, this is how you live this thing out, okay? Now, the theme is this. Practical advice to a troubled church with division. This is the theme. Practical advice to a troubled church with division. That's what's going on in this book. He's giving practical advice to this troubled church because they've got much division going on here in this church. Now, let me run through some key texts. Do we have those verses tonight? Okay. Um, 
And so let's read through these. Chapter 1, verse 9, just to start off, he says, God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He said, man, he's the one that called you into this relationship. He's the one that saved you, okay? Uh, don't forget that. Then chapter 1, verse 30 through 31, two more verses. He said, it is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God for us. Our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption is all through Jesus. And in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. He said, man, if you're going to be bragging on somebody, you need to brag on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? If you're going to talk smack to somebody, it needs to be about Jesus. Okay? He's saying, hey, and you need to understand that, again, if you can get a picture of this uh, immoral city that these people are living in, I mean, this is a tough context to do ministry. Okay? Chapter 2, verse 14 is another key verse. It says, but the person without the spirit or the natural man, okay, many translations may say, without the spirit does not receive what comes from God's spirit because it is, because it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. And then we'll talk about that in a minute. Chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. He goes over here and he's talking about how we are to live and how we're to flee sexual immorality and how he says that basically before that everything is per permissible for me but not everything is beneficial, okay? And then 19 through 20 he says, don't you know that your body is a temple or you could say the home of the Holy Spirit. Once you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and then dwells in you and resides in you because you've surrendered your life to Christ. He says the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have from God and then he says you are not your own for you were bought with Christ which is the precious blood of Jesus Christ so glorify God with your body other translations may add spirit glorify God with your body and spirit chapter 10 verse 31 pretty simple verse so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do whether it's playing football fishing or whatever else you want to put in there. He says what? Do everything for the glory of God. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, he's saying do it for the glory of God. Chapter 13, which is a great love chapter, and let's just look at the last verse, how he wraps it up. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And you know that. And then at the end, he wraps up with two great verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 through 8. He, uh, he says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be what? Steadfast, immovable, always excelling or always abounding in the Lord's work because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, that's a good word there for those folks. It's a good word for us today. Again, they're doing ministry in Las Vegas on steroids. <laughs> you say, hey, be steadfast, hang in there. Always abound, excel in God's work. I like that better, always excelling. Do the best you can. Don't give God your leftovers. And I think I see that so much in our churches. Well, if I can do that, I'll come. And then I'm only going to give you about half effort. And that's where your pastor wants to say, I want to give you 25 spiritual push-ups in the name of Jesus Christ. But he says, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And when you're doing ministry in a place like this, it's not always easy. And he's saying, hey, hang in there. The victory is in Jesus. And there's going to some days people are not going to want to listen to you. There's going to be some days you're trying to invite somebody to church and talk to them about Jesus and they don't want to have anything to say or they, they don't want to even have anything to do with you. 
Or as we read this week in Acts, how Paul is, uh, Saul got saved and he's been in Damascus and then he goes to Jerusalem. The disciples don't want to have anything to him, so he goes to talk to the Hellenistic Jews who he would have known really well. And he's telling them that Jesus is the Son of God and, man, you need to give your life to him. And what do they do? Hey, dude, we don't want to hear any of that. Hey, we're going to kill you. Amazing how it changed very fast. Chapter 7, in chapter 7 and 8, he's killing people and dragging them into prison. In the chapter 9, they're trying to kill him. Why? Because he'd been a radical Christ follower. So hang in there. That's what Paul's saying. Be steadfast. Now let me give you three key terms very quickly here. You see the word love 17 times in 14 verses. You're going to see the word spirit 56 times and 22 of those times it refers to the Holy Spirit. And then it's going to refer to the body. Now the body sometimes will be talking about our body. A couple other times it's going to be talking about the body of Christ, okay? And so those are three, you know, as you read through this book, you'll be reading through this book very soon, you're going to see that. Now Paul planted this church. He's writing in response to a report from Chloe's people, and he's dealing with some specifics. This church has division in it, it's got disorder in it, and they got difficulties in it. Okay? It's like anybody, any, you know, that there's not a perfect church. So they got some problems going on. So let's get into this outline and look at this book a little bit. Number one, chapters one through six, and it's basically this, this book is broken down into two sections. Paul addresses the issues in the church, okay? And what's going to be amazing, he'll find the problem, and then he will address it with the gospel and show them how they're not living out the gospel, and he will look at everything, every area of life, which you and I need to understand, we need to look at every area of life through the lens of the gospel, Okay? That's what I love, they, what they did with our students at camp. They would do an activity, and they would do a debriefing, and what would they do? They would apply it to the gospel. How does this, how could you share the gospel through this? Same way in our own life. And so there's a couple of uh, sections here. Number one is the divisions in the church. They got divisions in the church. They got preacher fans going on. I like Apollos. I like Paul. I like Peter. And they're all joining up and becoming followers and Twitter fans. Hey, I don't like Paul. I don't like the way he preaches. He's uh, he's short dude. He don't bring it. I like the way Apollos. He's very elegant. No, I like Peter because he don't hold anything back and he just... So you got all these groups, and what does Paul say? Hey, God's the one that gives the increase. You may water and do this and do that, but God's the one that gives the increase. And I love what Vance Havner used to tell the story how Jesus healed three blind, blind men in three different ways. The first, he touched one. And was healed. One he touched twice before the man could see clearly. And one he reached down and prepared some mud and put it on the man's eyes. And Havner said, if Jesus were to do that today, we'd have three denominations. The one-touch crowd, the two-touch crowd, and the mud-in-your-eye crowd. (laughs) And so they were having a vision over which preacher they liked. And it's becoming a popularity contest. He's saying, man, it's Jesus' it's church. What's, what's wrong with you folks? And how does he end up in chapter 1? Man, you need to boast in the Lord. That's what he's saying. Then in chapter 2, let me just bring this out. He's dealing with the natural man, the carnal man, and the spiritual man in chapter 2. Now, the natural man, he's talking about, and this is not only an outline. This is just, I'm just going to bring out a couple things here. Because I think this deals with everybody that walks in church every Sunday. The natural man does what comes natural. Why? Because he's a lost man. He's captive of his soul. He has no appreciation of spiritual things. He has no comprehension of spiritual things. Okay? When you're a natural man, when you are lost, you have no comprehension totally of spiritual things. And that's what Paul's talking about. Because you're captive to your soul. Then he talks about the spiritual man. 
That's the saved man. He's captured to the Spirit. He's informed by the Spirit. He's instructed by the Spirit. And he's given insight by the Spirit. But he also talks in chapter 3 about the carnal man. This is a saved man who acts like a lost man. He's captive to his flesh. He's weak. See, the, the willful carnal man is divisive because it's all about him. It's all about flesh. It's all about, hey, man, I'm not getting my needs met. And they've had that in the church as issues before. And so you can either be a natural man, you don't know Christ, you can be saved, or you can be a carnal Christian and know Christ but living like a lost man. And the fourth one would be you're a lost church member. See, those are the chairs. Which one are you in? See, either you're going to be natural man, spiritual man, carnal man, lost church member. Those are the four chairs right there. Which chair are you in? That's right where we all live. Every Sunday, you walk in God's house. I don't care where you preach. When I go to Haiti, when we go to Timbuktu, wherever we go, I promise you, anybody who comes to any service, anywhere, you're going to have four of those four categories in the house. Natural, saved, carnal, and you got lost church members because they think it's about church membership. Chapter 5 through 6, they deal with discipline in the church. There is a moral problem. If you don't believe me, go read this stinking book. Guy is sleeping with his stepmom. That's pretty sick. Then they got others in the church. They were going back to the temple prostitutes and doing the same thing. They were thinking, hey, we're free in Christ. We can do whatever we want to. I prayed and gave my life to Christ. Now I have freedom in Christ. I'm no longer tied to the law. But see, the law points us how to live for Christ. Too. And so you need to get it, man. These people got saved out of wickedness, and they were tempted to go back to it. And if you were saved out of that, too, you're tempted to go back to that, too. So he, he deals with church discipline here. There's discipline in the church. You may not think so. Go read what they do here. If you don't believe me, go read Matthew 18 and what Jesus says to do. Church is a body. Church is a family. American church doesn't want to have anything to do with church discipline. You know why? It's not politically correct. You know why? Because we got a bunch of carnal people in our churches and don't want anybody telling them how to live. Right? Let me do a poll. No, no, this is not no trouble. I want to I want to ask. I want to see. Have you ever seen it done done church discipline? You ever seen it done? A few. But not many. Now sometimes they could do it wrong and you're not to do it wrong. Let me just say this. I've had to do church discipline and you need to understand the number one purpose is is for restitution. Okay? Restitution. Not slap you upside the head with a two by four. What did I say? Restoration. Sorry. It's about restoration. Not restitution. I don't know where I got that word. Hey. I guess I've used my allotment of words. Sorry. Time to go. Uh, <laughs> but it's all about restoration. It's restoring the person. Not like you... No, it's about restoring them. Now, sometimes, you read here, if they don't want to restore, they want to keep living in gross sin, 
and people know about it and they're defiant to the church read find out what he says excommunicate them and treat them as a lost person now what happened if they decided to come back and they were repentant hey you restore them love them help them get back in the body so it's about restoration and again it's not about beating somebody over the head with a I mean a ball bat it's about hey are you doing this and if you are doing this <laughs> are sleeping with your stepmom this is not good and everybody knows it and you need to give it up and you need to come confess and get right with the body okay that's how church discipline should be dealt with why because all through this first part paul tells us in 110 i urge you i encourage you hey i want you to have unity i want you to have unity in the body so that you'll be a strong family that that you will grow and and impact Corinth, which Corinth, as we all would agree, I don't know, I, I get a visual picture of this city, and it ain't good. <laughs> My sanctified imagination does not picture Corinth being a nice city. I've been to Las Vegas. And New Orleans. And Atlanta. And Memphis. And seen... And I haven't even done those bad things in those cities, but you can just drive by and see some of that, and you know it's not good. And so I visualize this is a tough city, and Paul's saying, hey, y'all need to address what's going on in the body. Let's take care of these things in the church so that you can be salt and light to this lost city, which is ultimately lost. Okay, second part. Wow, we got some move. Uh, Paul addresses the questions they wrote to him. Now, chapter 7, verse 1 says this. Now, in response to the matters you write about, or wrote about, excuse me. So there's six areas of concerns. They wrote him and said, hey, Paul, what do we do here? Okay. First one is marriage. And he talks about marriage there, and we don't have time to get into it. He talks about, um, you know, if you're going to get married, hey, this is what you need to be doing as a husband and wife. But then he says, I wish you would be like me, which at that time he was single, so you can live for the kingdom. Then chapters 8 through 10, he's talking about idols, and he's really talking about the issue of eating meat sacrificed to the Greek gods. And there's two scenarios that he's bringing out. You know, hey, uh, if people have a problem with that, don't eat the meat in front of them, okay? But if you're at your house and you've got this meat and it's been sacrificed to idols and nobody's around, he says, it's okay because it's just meat. But he says, if it's going to cause somebody to stumble, don't do it. Just don't do it is what he's saying. He's saying love should be at the core of everything that you do. Okay? Then he talks about ordinances and women. Okay? And he talks about the Lord's Supper here. You're going to read 1 Corinthians 11, and he talks about head covering and how all of you ladies are in sin tonight because you didn't wear a hat in the God's house. No. It's not, sorry. <laughs> but if you never read the Bible much, uh, I know one of the ladies that got saved here uh, a couple years, well, with Rick Gage was here, and now she's got married and moved to the other side of town, and, and, and her She's going to church there with her husband and his family. And I remember she had not been saved long, and she's like, I was reading this week in 1 Corinthians, and it talked about wearing head covering. Does that mean I have to wear a, you know, a hat to church? It's like, no. What Paul is trying to get out there is their need. He, he's talking about submission. Okay, He's talking about the core of submission and how there needs to be submission in the church. Okay, And... And that's what he's bringing out, the core issue of submission, okay? And then he talks about the Lord's Supper, like I said. Uh, chapters 12 through 14, you've got spiritual gifts. And he talks about how when they gather, they're to use their gifts. In the middle of all that, you've got that great chapter on love. And he says, hey, basically it don't matter if you've got all these gifts. And, and if you don't use it with love, it's all just noisy gong and clashing cymbals. It's just a bunch of noise. 
Okay. Then, um, and, and what he's bringing out there also is saying, hey, whatever we do in orderly in our worship, it ought to be done decently in order. People, everybody shouldn't be speaking all at the same time, and we shouldn't be going crazy. Uh, because he says lost people walk in and everybody's talking or they're talking this and that and they're talking in 28 different languages. He says lost people are going to think y'all are crazy and they're walking out the door. That's a paraphrase for me. But that's what he says. Then he talks about the resurrection in chapter 15, how it's the court of our faith, our gospel, our teaching. And he basically says if there's no resurrection, <laughs> our faith is meaningless. There's no reason to be here but praise God as we preached two weeks ago hmm. he resurrected and we have victory in him and then chapter 16 he talks about the offering the need for the offering and what to do with that uh, and goes into that so there's six areas of concerns that you're going to read about um, in depthly there as we go through first Corinthians and there and he's addressing all those concerns okay why because they wrote to him about them and that's why so he's addressing the issues, okay, in the first part. Then he addresses their questions in the second part of the book. So let's get to the application and uh, give you some things to think about, and we will wrap up this book of 1 Corinthians. Number one, uh, sorry to blow your bubble, but there is no perfect church, and every church can have problems. look for a perfect church there is none besides if you and I to join it it would no longer be perfect the church is a family the church is the body of Christ he's going to bring out he says problems must be faced by people in leadership he's saying hey you can't ignore problems they don't disappear they don't go away. You can't sweep them under the carpet. You can't sweep under the carpet the sexual immorality that's going on in this church. You can't sweep that under the carpet because you know people in the area, in the city know what's going on. Maybe not all 700,000 people, but I promise you a lot of people do. And they'd be like, why do I want to go down? And I hear so-and-so, They, I saw them over with the temple prostitutes this week. And then did you hear about so-and-so? <clears throat> yeah. There's no perfect church. But if, you didn't deal with, if they didn't deal with those problems, it was only going to get worse. Which leads us to number two. Unsolved problems in churches hinder growth and hurt our witness. You want to know why a lot of people don't go to church? I heard about those people down there. All they do is argue and fight. I don't know about you, but I won't go to church that argues and fights the whole time either. I mean, we got not, I mean, why do we want to do that? Do we have discussions? Oh, yeah. Does your family have discussions? Oh, yeah. Will we agree on everything? Oh, no. Do we have to agree on the gospel? Yes. <laughs> Got to agree on the word of God? Yes. Got to agree on those main things? Yes. If not, we can't be family. But all families have disagreements. At least mine do. I don't know about yours. Maybe y'all's is all great. Maybe y'all need to tell us how to do it. Okay? Number three, persons who cause trouble in the church are not always lost. They could just be carnal and falling into sin and need someone to disciple them. But they're not always lost. Number four, Spiritual immaturity lies at the root of all problems. The reason we do have many problems in our churches and the reason they were having problems in their churches is they were not in the Word and they were spiritually immature. Because when you're spiritually immature, you're not going to be a spiritual man, you're going to be a carnal man. Why do you think I 
preach and encourage you and me to be spiritually mature and to grow. Because as we grow, then the church can grow. But when the church is spiritually mature and they're living in sin, the church will not grow. It's just not going to happen. When did the church, just study church history. Just study the church in America when they've had revival and it's been a long time. Is when the church got right and people are, they call them mourner's benches. And they had benches all through here. And I mean, there were people just lined up coming and they were praying and weeping over their sin. And because they were sinning, they got right with God. And because they got right with God in the altar, then they went out in the community and people saw lives change and they had a heart for the gospel and they shared the gospel. And then they saw revival and awakening. That's how things bust wide open in our country in 1750 and the early 1800s and early 1900s. But it hadn't happened like that in a long time. Well, Jesus movement, and you saw some. And you've seen pockets in our country, but nothing widespread throughout our whole country. Number five, the source of love we need to solve to solve problems lies in closeness to Jesus Christ. We just draw close to Jesus, we'll realize, man. It's all about love. I need to love them. I need to help them. It's the love of Jesus that motivates me to do this. That's why. Number six, if what you're doing might cause someone to stumble, then don't do it. If you got a question about it, well, should I do this? Just think, is that going to cause somebody to stumble? Especially if it's somebody that doesn't know the Lord. Or let's say it's someone that's a brand new Christian and they see you doing this. Will it cause them to stumble? You can feel You're bright. And number one, you know the Lord, so you already have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will let you know. It's just we want to cover him up in those times, right? Oh, quit saying that. It's correct. So don't cause people to stumble. That grieves the heart of God. It really does. It grieves my heart when I hear it happening in other churches too. That just grieves the heart of God. And it just gives the church a bad name. Number seven, right? Number seven. Christ followers ought to be known by their love for people. That's the series that we're doing, by our love. We ought, to know and be loved. we ought to be known by our love for people. I mean, at least, hey, I may not agree with those people down there at Bethsaida, but they're the most loving people I've ever met. That's what you want to hear. Those people are doing a lot of things, and I know they're doing it because they love Jesus. May we be known for our love instead of all of what we hate. <laughs> May we be known for our love. And so that's kind of the series. Today, I love my church. Next week, we'll look at another one. And then another one for the next four Sundays. No, you won't. <laughs> Not unless y'all are buying them. One's enough. Uh, one's enough. Wear it. Love it. Praise the Lord. Students said they're going to wear it to high school tomorrow. Amen. And uh, wear it and show people that you love your church and you love Jesus. Okay? Number eight. Do not allow culture to affect the way you live. Man, and this is... This is this is huge for them, and it's huge for us. Instead, live in such a way for the Lord Jesus Christ that you affect the culture for good. So that's where we are right now, to be honest with you folks. Culture has shifted so huge. I'm not saying we go with culture. You need to hear me, okay? I think we're living in such a way we're to affect culture. Because you need to understand, we <laughs> if you live this life in Christ that we see in Scripture, and it's a radical lifestyle, you need to understand it is upstream of culture. 
culture is rapidly going this way, downhill, fast and furious. We've got to go upstream with the gospel, which means, again, let me just say this. We are blessed where we live. I'm serious. Praise the Lord. There's a lot of cities we could not have done what we did la this last Friday. <laughs> There's a lot of places. Let a preacher come in? Share Jesus? The gospel? And then pray in the name of Jesus? We're blessed. But just understand, this culture here has changed a lot too. You say, why? 33% of the people within a 10-mile radius of here think same-sex is okay. 10-mile radius of here, only 16% of the people went to church today. 10-mile radius, 66% of the people don't even go to church. They don't even go to the snake-handling church. They didn't even go to the feel-good church. They didn't even go to the lollipop church. They don't go to anybody's church. What has swayed them? Culture. And they're going the way of culture very fast. And we have to do everything we can to run upstream and try to dr yank as many people out of that stream as possible that are willing to be come to know Christ. The thing that Paul says, and I really think, I just want to leave this last thought with you and I'm done. that I really see, and I mentioned in the beginning, that what we have to try to live out is we have to see every part of our life through the lens or the Ray-Bans or the Oakleys, the sunglasses, whatever, you wanna, whatever adjective you want to use through the picture of the gospel. The gospel should be the filter for all of our life, all of our actions, and all of our words. You say, I thought the gospel saves me. You're right. But you need to understand, saves you salvation, justification. But then there's sanctification. That's the gospel working on us to where every day, hopefully we become more and more like Jesus and hopefully once we get way down here and we're fixing to graduate and go see the King of Kings and Lord of Lords hopefully we are so much like Jesus we don't even remember this old life very much but we've got to allow the gospel to affect us but we've got to allow the gospel to affect our lives so that we can affect other lives because we do live in a Corinthian culture and it is going fast and furious that way, apart from revival and awakening. Is it always going to move that way? Yeah. Why? Lost people and culture and the devil are going to push it that way. But read to the end of the book. Does it get any better in the end? No. It's got to get worse before it gets better. Say, when will that happen? We'll get to Revelation. You'll figure it all out. Not. But as far as 1 Corinthians, as you read it, remember the culture. Remember what's going on. And then remember what culture we live in and try to live your life through the lens of the gospel. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do love you and praise you. Again, we do thank you so much.